This has been an extraordinary weekend of poetry, scholarship, and celebration of the life, work, and influence of Gwendolyn Brooks. Thank you all for coming and for contributing such a range of voices and perspectives to the conversation. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's 2017 Pearl Andelson Sherry Memorial Poetry Reading, featuring the work of three remarkable poets, Aishan Hutchinson, Patricia Smith, and Ed Roberson, whose writing advances the living tradition we've been fortunate to celebrate in our Gwendolyn Brooks Centennial at the University of Chicago. Before we begin, let me take a few moments to say a, a few words about Pearl Anderson, Andelson Sherry. Sherry was born on the west side of Chicago in 1899. She studied at the University of Chicago and went on to begin her literary career at Poetry Magazine under the editorship of Harriet Monroe. Her first book of poetry, Fringe, was published in 1923, and her poetry, fiction, and reviews appeared in many periodicals, including The Dial, Poetry, The New Republic, and The Southern Review. She continued to write and publish poetry until shortly before her death in 1996. Established in 1997 through a gift from the Sherry family, the Pearl Andelson Sherry Memorial Fund annually brings a cont major contemporary poet, or in tonight's case, three of them, to the University of Chicago. Now this evening's readers. I won't recite our poet's copious achievements and recognitions, as that would take all night. In a package of minutes, Brooks writes, there is this we. Collective experience in her work, life, and politics resists declension into the accusative case. Not there is this us, but rather always, already, there is this we. Refusing to assimilate her first person plural into authorized grammars, she produces some of the most famous verses in the black literary tradition. We real cool. Who is this we? In the package of minutes ahead, we'll hear three poets who explore diverse approaches to the open question of black collectivity in our time. On first reading, Aishan Hutchinson sounds like the herald of an exu exultant, rebarbative, irrepressible first person singular. I upset her. I Django on the black wax, the super ape, E.T. I cleared the wave, he writes. But this I speaks under the sign of a colonialist history that subordinates individual experience to the totalizing minister of all, also known as the man, the gorgon, dawn of dawns, the president, minister, chief. This spectral politico turns a blind eye to what poetry makes sensible. You'd shudder to see them, bare-backed men, bent kissing the earth, so to slash away the roots of the canes. Every year, the same men, different cane. And when different men, the same cane. In Hutchinson's poetry, we hear the work songs of agricultural laborers slashing at harvest. History, he writes, is dismantled music. But we also feel the tidal push and pull of sameness and difference that gathers any eye into the we from which it endlessly departs. At Land's End, this poet writes, I sit on a log, facing it, the white detonating curtain, the sea, our sea. Our second reader, Patricia Smith, is an incendiary elegist for the victims of lynchings, urban violence, and police murder. Emmett Till, the girls in the 16th Street Baptist Church, Trayvon Martin, and too many others that haunt the American conscience. Where all else fails, political marches, online petitions, media coverage, can poetry make their names matter? Our word for matter derives from mother, and Smith regards black life in its violent reduction to nominal matter with familial care. The body is secured in a blue body bag, she writes in her elegy for Michael Brown. The body is secured in a blues body bag. The body was crafted to absorb the blues. The blues, Smith reminds us, is a singular plural. 
reflective of black experience in our nation's history. How many bodies add up to a we? How many blue body bags does it take to give any body a permanent case of the blues? Smith's art instructs us in the deep calculus of thinking color. There are 52 shades of blue, she observes, or a million and 52, depending on which river you ask. Ed Roberson, who will conclude this evening's reading, asks us to think collectivity on a macroscopic scale. We look at the world to see the earth, he writes. But what of the world is seen in looking at the earth? Yet, even when looking from several removes at Wallace Stevens, regarding the eye of a blackbird, searching out something beyond us among 20 snowy mountains, Roberson notes that no one notices your eye, a black history. Perception itself, in this writer's work, feels both universal and particular because we're all the displaced first person of I keep arriving at a house that isn't mine. We've all listened to the rain you can't hear to the edge of. But Roberson also makes us aware with sharpened acuity of how John Coltrane, in all his historical specificity, can be heard in the silence at the end of one recording to say, help. Live not for the end of the song, Gwendolyn Brooks counsels the next generation. Live in the along. Roberson asks us how to live in the social along after the end of her song. We might hear a cry for help there, or a bonus track, or maybe a standing ovation. Listening on, this poet tests the edge of perception and reception. I've never understood why applause counts at the precise point that what doesn't matter is the audience. It's too late to listen. Please join me in welcoming our three poets, Aishan Hutchinson, Patricia Smith, and Ed Roberson, with applause. Their work shows us it's never too late to listen. Very grateful again to um, be at the microphone and to be able to say thank you um, for having me here and for this conference. Greatly humbled to read with uh, Ed and Patricia. A march. Lesson of the day. Syria and Styria. For Syria, read his conquering banner shook from Syria. And for Styria, look at this harp of blood mapping. Now I am tuned. I am going to go above my voice for the sake of the forest shaken on the bitumen. You can see stars in the skulls, winking synapses, intermittent on edge of shriek, perhaps a cluster of fear, birches. Anyway, don't get too hung up on the terms. They have entropy in common, bad for the public wheel. Those obtuse centurions in the flare of the bougainvillea, their patent-seeking gift kindled, diverse speech, cruelty, justice, never mind, but do pay attention to the skirmish, the white panther that flitters up the pole, its shade grows large on the ground. A further shore, by the shadowless lion bluff of Pigeon Island, you've gone swimming, a clear afternoon, children's faint play noises ring in the yard by the hyphen church school near century-old cafes, one with a zinc fence signed in comic icons, ice cream and other supplies, skides your sides with laughter. But they vanish near the beach stretch, the piratical atelier's paradise, a white army of luxury boats idled, processional, waiting for a flare to blow and ignite another plantation. 
without Bible or chains. Just the Prime Minister's handshake and bow. You ignore them for your first immersion. The blue water whitens and collects you in its salt mine. Ah, Vejo. So this is the chessboard you wrote about, as by slight, an emerald patient army poised for your command, a voice without force to crack the terracotta quiet, steadily erect between two flailing lives, memory and this, the present, advancing only down, the body's tower rattled by what it carries, diabetes and your gift, the mighty unscathed mourn. We will not mourn at the bishop's speech that day, not when he crosses himself twice and X. We will be like the breakers on the beach at Kasambar, mute with rage, serenely vexed that your life is not a chess game, played again in the shade with other shades, companions, literature, not language, as made aware of the other's ignorance shifting in time. Bicycle Eclogue. That red bicycle left in, in an alley near the Ponte Vecchio, I claim. I claim its elongated shade, though, shadow, ship crested and stocked crates. I claim the sour mouth Arno and the stone arch bending sunlight on vanished medieval fairs. But mostly, I claim this two-wheel chariot vetching on the wall, its sickle fenders reaping dust and pollen off the heat-congested city coiled to a halt in traffic. And I, without enough for the great museums, am struck by the red on the weathered brick, new tires on cobble, the bronze tulip bell, smaller than Venus's nose, turned up against the river, completely itself for itself. The scar in my palm throbs, recalling a tiny stone once stuck there after I fell off the district's iron mule, welded by the local artisan, barrel mouth, no relation of Botticelli, the summer of my first long pants. The doctor's scissors probing my flesh didn't hurt, nor the lifeline bust open when the stone was plucked out. What I wailed for that afternoon was the anger in mother's face when she found out I had disobeyed her simple wish to remain indoors until she returned from kneeling in the harvested cane, tearing out the charred roots from the earth after cane cutters had slashed the burnt field. It was her first day and her last, bowing so low to pull enough for my school fee, for again, the promised money did not fall from my father's cold heaven in England. As we walked to the clinic on a rabble of hog plums, her mouth trembled in her suit frock, my palm reddened in her grip, plum scent taking us through the lane. By the time we saw the hospital's rusty gate, her fist was stained to my finger's curl, and when I unfastened my eyes from the ground to her face, gazing ahead, terribly calm in the hail of sunlight, a yellow shawl around her head. Something of shame became clear, and if I had more sense, as my blood darkened to sorrel at the age of 12 or 13, I would have forgotten the sting and rioted tighter my hold before letting her go. And now, as I raise my camera, bells charge the pigeon sky braced by the dormer a shell falling from the sun. I kneel, snap the cycle, rise, hurry away, punishment. All the dead eyes of the dead on portraits behind her looked down as she ate donuts off a cloth napkin. Her mouth sugared. I saw myself possessed by myself in her glasses, milky lens that possessed the globe on her desk, a Quaker gift the former principal, dead but not yet a portrait, left with Africa spun towards us. She swallowed, then asked, why was I here? I told her, 
for intimations. She stopped mid chew surplus of sugar danced at the down curl of her lips. She said, excuse me? I continued, for immortality. She looked with cow out of past her concern. The other's eyes scalded through me. The clock fell silent, though the second hand wielded around the white face. For my freshness, she said, you must be punished. You must go out to the cemetery by the chapel. Write down every last living name off the tombstones before she arrived. No problem. I knew the dead. I was well off with their names. But she asked, a fresh donut christened the napkin, if I am clear why she has done this, why she must punish me. The portraits drew one breath. I began for my rejection of things past, because for my life the green graves by the chapel puzzle me, and the sea outside our classroom, those ships no one else sees, humming, humming, their frail sails join us, though I don't know who us is. She rose, utterly black. I retreated. She filed past the cabinet, upset the globe. I whirled out the door. There, cliffs and clouds, the dark mansionil blinding the path. I bolted down, hardly believing my legs running and leaping above ground, straight down Hector's River Sea Road, flanked by this hushed, breaking sea. Sibelius and Marley. History is dismantled music. Slant, bleak on gravel. One amasses silence. Another chastises silence with nettles, stinging ferns. I oscillate in their jaws. The whole gut listens. The air winces white nights in his talons, sink in mire. He wails on a comet impales the sky with the dual wink of a wasp burning. Music dismantles history. The flambeau in flame in his eyes with a locust plague, a rough gauze bolting up his mouth unfolds, so he lashes the air with ropes and roots that converge on a dreadful zero, a golden age. Somewhere, an old film, dusk soldiers on a cold, barren coast. There, I am a cenotaph of horns and stones. Sprawl. Amid ice and granite, sea hush and crash, and the prophet and the loss, the prophet Xerox in his tamarind shade, and wasp buzz and saw in the hills crash leaves and virgins suicides right after the election and November's Janus and Pontius Pilate's maggot snipers, amen. And fortunately I forgot to be afraid and kept my fear in the salt chisel in my face when I read Keats and love the ash and put two coins in my right palm amid the crash crop century of wheat drought rosary terracotta cali reconnaissance renaissance my nipples torpedoed on rock the strobe lit stage show the gorgon's scintillated romans foiled the constable's peace and Herodotus slept as the prophet rose to his chalice and put on his mongrel pelt. And it rained softly and blessed nothing scarce of breath and grated nutmeg and the tyranny of sugar and pure cream soda enclosed in cinders, shook, burst, fizzed, and I found my shape shifted, ciphered, raw, my total reversal, my total reversal, my total reversal. Thank you.
How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, it is always glorious to come home whenever Miss Brooks calls. And I'm, a, I'm at home for about six days this month, and everything I'm doing is because of Gwendolyn Brooks Centennial. So I'm very happy about that. Let's see. Okay. You know, you turn the pages down and they come. Okay, here we go. Winter, with its numbing gust and giddy twist of ice, is gone now. It is time for warmth again. So where is Gwendolyn Brooks? Its huge shoulders slumped, Chicago craves her hobble, turns pissed in gray, undust her name. To know her, you need to ride her city's wide, watery hips. You need to inhale an obscene sausage smothered in gold-slipping onions while standing on a chaotic street cross where any jazz could be yours. Walk the hurting fields of the west side, our slice of city burned to bones in 68. Goldblatt's, the colored Bloomingdale's, gone. Learners, where we learned pinafore, gone. No more havens for layaway. No more places to plop down a dollar a week for PF flyers or wool jumpers with seams glued shut. The meat market with its mutt bloody sawdust, torch, its proprietors now crisping languid under Florida sun and flap-jowled Mayor Daly, our big, benevolent, murderous daddy, gifted us with high-rise castles crafted of dirty dollars, battered cans of bumpy milk, and free cheese. <laughs> to know Gwen, you need to know the Alex, the only movie theater west where frisky rats, biggest toddlers, poke slow noses into your popcorn, then locked red round eyes on Cleopatra Jones and sat confident and transfixed. <laughs> After the movies and any corners fried lunch, we'd head to the store in the back of that fat man's house to surrender hoarded quarters for the latest 45, striped licorice in black or red, pork rinds, Boston baked beans, or fat sour pickles floating in a jar in the corner. The fat man's wife, Miss Caroline, plunged her hammy forearm into the brine, pulled out the exact pickle you pointed to, and shoved it deep into a single-ply paper bag. Only the truly Negro would then poke a peppermint stick. Hold on. <laughs> Hi, Avery. West side, west side. Okay. Only the truly Negro would then poke a peppermint stick down the center of that pickle and slurp the dizzy of salt and sugar. <laughs> we gnawed rock-stiff candy dots off paper columns, suffered lemon heads and red hots, pushed neon sweat socks down on Vaseline calves, and my lord, we learned to switch. For a dime, the fat man would warm up the record player, click reject, and give us a hit of Miss Fontella Bass, heartbroke, heart clamoring for rescue, or Ruby Andrews, steady wailing in a woman way. There were so many millions of each one of us, ashy goddesses walking the wild west, strutting past slope storefronts where brown meat and hogsheads crowded the windows, past shuttered groceries and gas stations with pump boys iron our new undulating asses, past fashion palaces where almost no money satisfied our yearning for hollow glamour with cheap threads already unraveling. Observe the kick-ass angle of our crowns. Chicago girls just keep coming back. They don't hear you. They don't see you. They ain't never really needed you. <laughs> they got the Holy Ghost in Garfield Park on one city block. They got a hundred ways to buy chicken. They jump rope nasty and barefoot in the dirt. They got the Uachi Koo, the pink plastic clothesline underhand. They got the slip bone. They got the Gwen in them. <laughs> and any jazz could be ours. Her jazz was. Unflinching in riotous head wrap and thick two shades, two stockings, she penned the soundtrack of we because she knew, because she was skinny early church and not bending, because no man could ever hold her the way Hurt did, because she could peer at you over those Coke bottle specs fast gal and turn the sorry sight of you into her next poem. <laughs> Each year she stays gone 
we colored girls aimlessly bop and search dangerous places for music. Chicago bows its huge head and grudgingly accepts spring. God, if there is a you, there must surely still be a her. Stop the relentless seasons. Show us your face. Explain your skewed timing, your insane choice of angels. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to read the, the title poem of uh, the new book, Incendiary Art, that started when I heard somebody. I was in an airport, and we were watching the, uh, the unrest following the Michael Brown murder, and someone said, there they go again, burning down their own neighborhoods. Incendiary Art. The city's streets are densely shelled with rows of salt and packaged hair. Intent on air, the funk of craven function comes to blows with any smell that isn't oil. The blare of storefront chicken settles on the skin and mango spritzing drips from razored hair. The corner chefs cue pork, decide again on cayenne, fry in grease that's glopped with dust. The sizzle of the feast adds to the din of children strutting slant, their wanderlusts and cussing, plus the loud and tactless hiss of dogged hustlers bellowing past gust of peppered breeze, that fatty, fragrant bliss in skillets. All our rampant hunger tricks us into thinking we can dare dismiss the thing men do to boulevards, the wicks their bodies be. A city strapped for art delights in torching them, at first for kicks, to waltz to whirling sparks, but soon those hearts thud thinner, whittled by the chomp of heat. Outlined in chalk, men blacken and curl apart. Their blindly rising fume is bittersweet, although reversals in the air could fool us into thinking they weren't meant as meat. Our sons don't burn their cities as a rule, born as they are up to their necks in fuel. This one is for my mother. My mother came up uh, during the Great Migration, came up from Alabama, and was very ashamed of being from the South. And I think this is probably self-explanatory, yeah. One, my mother is learning English pulling rubbery cinnamon-tinged holes to a roll beneath her knees, sporting one swirling Baptist ski slope of a hat. She rides the rattling elevator to a windy city spire and pulls back her gulp as the elevator hurdles upward. Then she's stiffly seated at a scarred oak table across from a white government-sanctioned savior who has dedicated eight hours a week to straightening afflicted black tongues. She guides my mother patiently through lazy ings and errs, slowly scraping her throat clean of the moist and raging infection of Aliceville, Alabama. There are barely muttered apologies for colored sounds. There is much beginning again. I want to talk right before I die. Want to stop saying ain't and I done been like I ain't got no sense. I'm a grown woman. I didn't live too long to be stupid, acting like I just got off the boat. My mother has never been on a boat. <laughs> but 50 years ago, merely a million of her, clutching strapped cases, Jets Emmett Till issue, and thick peppered chicken wings in waxed bags, stepped off hot rumbling buses at northern stations in Detroit, in Philly, in the bricked cornfield of Chicago, brushing stubborn scarlet dust from their shoes. They said, we north now, slinging it in backdoor syllable as if those three words were vessels big enough to hold country folks overwrought ideas of light, too. Back then, my mother thought it a modern miracle, this new living in a box stacked upon other boxes, where every flat surface reeked of Lysol and effort, and chubby roaches, cross-eyed with raid, dragged themselves across freshly washed dishes and dropped dizzy from the ceiling into our Murphy beds, 
our wash tubs, our open steaming pots of collards. Of course, there was a factory just two buses close, a job that didn't involve white babies or blue laundry, where she worked in tense line with other dreamers, repeatedly, 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 all those oily, hot combed heads drooping, no talking as scarred brown hands romanced to machines, just the sound of doing it right and juicy fruit cackin'. A mere mile set away, there had to be a corner tavern where dead blues men begged second chances from the juke and where my mama perched man weary on a comfortable stool by the door could look like a Christian who was just leaving. And on Sunday at Pilgrim Rest Missionary Baptist Church, she would pull on the pure white gloves of service and wail to the rafters when the Holy Ghost hot hand grew itchy and insistent at the small of her back. She was his child, finally loosed of that damnable delta, building herself anew in this land of sidewalks, blue jukes, and sizzling fried perch in virgin white boxes. See her, all nap burned from her crown, one gold tooth winking, soft hair riding her lip, blouses starched hard, Orlon sweaters with smatterings of stitched roses, A-line skirts the color of unleashed winter. Three. My mother's voice is like homemade cornbread, slathered with butter and full of places for heat to hide. When she is pissed, it punches straight out and clears the room. When she is scared, it turns practical, matter of fact, like when she called to say, they found your daddy this morning. Somebody shot him, he dead. He ain't come to work this morning, I knowed something was wrong. When mama talks, the southern swing of it is wild with unexpected blooms, like the fields she never told me about in Alabama. Her rap is peppered with ain't gots and I done bins and he bees, just like mine is when I'm color among color. During worship, when talk becomes song, her voice collapses and loses all acquaintance with key. So of course, it's my mother's fractured alto wailing above everybody, uncaged, unapologetic, and creaking toward heaven. Now she wants to sound proper when she gets there. A woman got some sense and future need to upright herself, talk English instead of talking wrong. It's strange to hear the precise rote of Annie Pearl's new mouth. She slips sometimes, but is proud when she remembers to bite down on dirt-crafted contractions and double negatives. Sometimes I wonder whatever happened to the warm expanse of the red dust woman who arrived with a little sin and all the good wrong words. I dream her breathless, maybe leaning forward a little in her seat on the greyhound. I ain't never seen, she begins grinning through the grime at Chicago, city of huge shoulders, thief of tongues. I have two more, is that okay? I have, I'm not, I feel, I feel like I'm going over. No. <laughs> two more. I grew up on the west side, and this, uh, this is a poem uh, basically about the Madison Street bus, the old Madison Street bus that went through the old west side not the Madison Street bus that goes through the West Side now because the West Side doesn't look the way the West Side looked at the time of this poem. Tavern. Tavern. Church. Shuttered tavern. Then go blats. With its finger-smeared display windows full of stifled plaid pinafore and hard-tailored serge, each unattainable thread cooing the delayed lusciousness of layaway. Another church then, of course, Jesus pitching a blustery bitch on every other block. Then the butcher shop with, hard to believe, the blanched archaic head of a hog propped upright to lure waffling patrons into the steamy innards of yet another storefront where they drag their feet through sawdust and revel in the come hither bouquet of blood. Then a vacant lot, then another vacant lot, right up against a shoe store specializing in unyielding leather, all stars and glittered stacked heels designed for the Christian woman daring the jukebox. Then the whatnot joint with vanilla ice long johns 
hands, wax lips crammed with sugar water, notebook paper, swollen sour pickles buoyant in a splintered barrel, school supplies, pixie sticks, licorice whips, and vaguely warped 45s by Fontella Bass or Johnny Taylor. Now, ooh, what's that blue pepper? Piercing the air with the nouns of backwood and cheap delta cuts, neck and gizzard, skin and claw. It's the chicken shack wobbling on a foundation of board, grease riding relentless on three of its walls, the slick cuisine served up in virgin white cardboard boxes with Tabasco nibbling the seams, scorched wings under soaked slices of wonder, blind perch fried limp, spice like it's a mistake Mississippi done made. And speaking of, comma, July moans around a perfect perfume tangle of eight Baptist gals on the corner of Kedzie and Warren, fanning themselves with their own impending funerals, fluid-filled ankles like tree trunks sprouting from narrow slingbacks, choking in Sears' best cinnamon-tinged toes, their legs so unlike their arms and faces. On the other side of the street is everything they are trying to be beyond, everything they are trying to ignore, the great promise of government, 25 floors of lying windows, of peeling grates called balconies, of yellow panties and shredded diapers fluttering from open windows, of them nasty girls with wide avenue hips stomping double dutch in the concrete courtyard, spewing their woman verses too fueled and irreversible to be not listened to and wiggled against, and the Madison Street bus revs its tired engine, backs up a little for traction, and drives smoothly into the sweaty space between their legs, which is the only route out of the day that we are riding through. I know that's a weird-ass poem. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, and last one. This is, there, there are a number of incendiary art poems in here. There's incendiary art, Birmingham, about the four girls lost in the church bombing. There's incendiary art, Chicago, which was written about riots following the King assassination. There's incendiary art, Los Angeles, which is Rodney King. Uh, there's Tulsa. Uh, there's Philadelphia move. At the end, it comes right back down to the body, and this was written during the time one of Donald Trump's uh, campaign rallies where they interviewed a man who said that he sure would like to burn a black man alive. Incendiary art, the body. I've nightmared your writhe, glum fists punching their way out of your own body, the blind stumble through the buckled vein of your throat as your nerve ending sputtered and blew. I've dipped my finger into a vaporous pool of your skin. The heat blessed your whole new self with horizon, square-jawed boy. With such potent intent, you blared illicit and just enough saint. Now, with so many northern days between us, you are much easier to God. But they are looking for you. They are wildly sloshing fuel across the landscape, and they are screeching your name. Today, one said, I sure would like to burn a black man alive. So yeah, you left us here with undulating acres of fools in that particular stank leg of gospel. You left us all this snuff, hawk, and proud little bowleg. You left their brains stunned by dairy and fat meat. You left us not much path, even after your body was that brief, beauteous torch. They seem to remember you fondly, and there are unstruck matches everywhere. Thank you very much. Patricia, do the bus. Did that Chicago stop downstairs? <laughs> That's a fine picture of Chicago. I used to go garden flowers all over around my house. I liked flowers. Uh, my place was always covered with flowers. And I like forsythia. Every year I'd see them come up and there were two words that went side by side in my head is for Scythia and the yellow dishes. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but for Scythia, for Scythia and yellow dishes on side by side. And I couldn't, for years, I couldn't figure out what to do with those two words. 
And then I came across in Shakespeare, it's like his eggs, as a, as a, as a simile. And uh, all of a sudden I got my head a piece of paper and started working. This is the first poem in um, the, the, the next to the last book, To See the Earth Before the End of the World. The year, and it's as like his eggs. The days in their crates of season we break open, and the yoke of fresh sun we scramble the runny light into, a firm break of the night's winter helping of the fast. Yellow dishes for Scythia, set out for the early meal of season. Sit the house, yards, the town, parks, down together to this spring as to a table, all set in order just so good to see you and your way found back. The arriving coats of smell are hung in the air, but smacked in oiled babies of moment. And years of taste as touch hug the senses to the living. The sweet, sour, bitter, salty, some never experienced again. The gloved fingers of bananas, so briefly kissed with ripeness, fruit, grip-shaped thought brought to the tongue, the finished taste of words, an aftertaste of silence, the morning glories we haven't tasted yet. Life lasting as any one sense, a taste, a sight, an orange mix of, ki mix of kiss, with sweetness for the moment it exists, finishes, is swallowed, is also those who finish hungry or starve to death, which swallows the final stage, a rattlesnake bite, is yellow vision, light. Then you both go out. Fear to the tongue is metallic. I tasted a copper penny. It could have been a one-time and final incomparable. How does this life taste to one condemned in that cup this morning? Flash of a taste, a touch's backbeat, that single shake in the whole coil of bands, that whiff of a one-time and final taste, taste, taste this morning. When I was young and foolish, I'm old and foolish now. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> I used to climb mountains. And uh, last month, the guy said, uh, we're at 18,000 feet. We're going up to 35. You know. uh, and he, when he said 18,000 feet, I sort of looked out the window and laughed at myself. I walked this distance. I walked this high. <laughs> and then I decided, you know, I better stop thinking like that because it's not, all the rest of the way is down. <laughs> so, but we started to think about some, some things to see the earth before the end of the world. People are grabbing at the chance to see the earth before the end of the world. The world's death, piece by piece, each longer than we. Some endings of the world overlap our lived time, skidding for generations to the crash scene of species extinction. The five minutes it takes for the plane to fall, the mile ago it takes to stop the train, the small bay to coast the liner into the ground, the line of title to a nation until the land dies, the continent uninhabitable. That very subtlety of time between large and small. Media note, for instance, people chasing glaciers in the retreat up their valleys. And the speed, well, watched ice was speed made invisible. Now it's days and a few feet further away a subtle collapse of time between large and our small human extinction. If I have a table at this event, mine bears an ice sculpture of whatever loss it is, it lasts as long as ice does until it disappears into its polar white and it melts and the ground beneath it into vapor, into air. All that once chased us and we chase to a balance 
chasing back tooth for spear, knife for claw, locks us in this grip. We just now see our own lives taken by, taking them out, hunting the bear. We hunt the glacier with the changes come of that choice. The plane begins its descent into Newark from the west at the Delaware Water Gap. The whole width of the state of New Jersey is a base of a triangle underlying that approach to its point, geography test. Here, the problem off the wall to the ground, whole highway systems found again below, the maps we rode. But at what point did we become so familiar with such long perspective we could look down and recognize the pal of Denver by the drop off and crumble of the plate up into the Rockies, or say, that's Detroit, by the link of lakes by Saint Lake St. Clair, some 30,000 feet above Lake Erie, while just barely spotting Huron on the horizon. Some earlier hunter has similar picture in his head for getting around. And what he saw seems map, his feet figured. What a Boeing 757 picks up and puts down, pacing off my passing through the world by air. But we've seen the ground ball up into one step and stand on nothing else. Our footing in the vacuum diminished sky of solar space. Yet we haven't seen again his vision haven't yet dreamt from it even such map as he had hunted by. We haven't seen answered from that gardener's gazing ball whether there is a direction after all the dream lines have been hunted to circumference. Like trained bear dancing on a circus ball, we look down, our feet in a step from which there is no step off. This footprint, all of step ever taken, the hunted step, kept far and fast enough away from the hunter to keep the distance of its own life shortens to none between them. Or is that shit outcome stepped in, become their one in perspective, step from which there is no step out of, in the sense of the surface over which a phenomenon exists, the earth is a footprint of life. God is gravity swaying steps take on orbit. We in the tropic of balance in a basket on her head, a blue wrap of sky, sun ripened the thin rind of the plain to home. Sweet fruit of the journey, of all journey, fruit of all step. Home is a sweet fruit that is all of step that is ever taken. The world then was made up of the same pieces that turned into what we have now. Pieces the same that nowhere took any of what then I thought was the world and the world to come that came about. A now. I don't know what I thought that put the wrecks of the past back into effect. As if in progress. Back in service. We think somewhere between right and understanding. We never supposed there'd be this wrong about this. Facing up to the light sky is way off is a vertigo of falling up off the face of, not so much the earth's off into space as off any hold that was ourselves together in what balance lasting in the stars. See, through the bore column of straight up to the end of the stars, that we could be lost that deeply, that we could lose all of thus far by this far, our moments here, far off. We see the further away, the more distant, as the deeper into time, backwards up to here, how far come. But time's direction further, equal this far, goes through town. Its whistle is this minute crossing, and its wall of boxcar all our view. That lonesome whistle silence of stars through here sees this, how you pull this minute of your sleeve off inside out, then reach in the past, pull the future out again. In these two distances, your name, your same, unthinking arm of galaxy through time, undoing or one motion through the Milky Way folding its complexity. The dark drawer, it's over your head. But a small thing, you lose your balance, 
you fall into the dark shirt never pulled off your head. He wore his glasses as if bags beneath his eyes were stuffed with his reflections of the lines and the shown light at just the right angle on them, in them. But the point where what is written about lies, where whole heavens fall into question in his eyes. Answered with help, answered with, answered with nothing of that great love left, but the grab for authority as the supreme. God as looting, storefront to storefront, the same as door to door. More than a few seconds after waking, I could still feel my thumb burnt. Where I dreamed I was so hungry, I picked up like a dime from a sizzling grill the meat cooking. And I wondered, how long would I stay burned without that fire of dream? How would I live? Teapot boiling, how to begin the day. That a beautiful woman gone to pieces never finishes her cup from a little coffee shop somewhere says war shouldn't be convenient as add water and stir. But somewhere water begins to boil. The ticking pop of the gases faster and faster. The first few shots explode into full fire. Surface turmoil wails from a single simple teapot begins a simple day toward its disasters. Don't believe the writing on the packaging. It's more difficult than it says. Recall that car, the eight people cramped inside, the large landscape of talk and excitements, often in the wrong lane, open by faith and innocence, both in which we innocently had so little faith. Proceeding through the opening, through the closing openings in traffic just in time. Then beside the road, recall someone had set the sapling of a bright yellow willow in a huge space. Evidently, eventually its grace would take and how the color of the, that spring had already filled that space. Art in the third grade. Closely observed realities gain ground over religious and classical subjects. The real have a hard edge horizon near the middle. Not much to balance one at a time, but together, extremely uncertain as resolution. Vertiginous, all kinds of smart alignments and blind pairings. Earliest of those purely observed that I felt only myself see by the third grade was meat in the butcher shop. Pig's feet. The skins looked like my seat partner's hands, and I felt this sadness for her. She was ugly, and she wasn't supposed to be being white. It was my secret then that I could see it as meat, and supposed to be, supposed to really be looked at. Some of them are more of a light than they are color. The flowers ultraviolet that in certain Cloudy sunlight blurs the limiting borders out of sight and glows, or ice that the sky running around inside its facets, switching the flashlight blue to green, milky green, almost phosphorescent, a glow in the dark moment for in daylight. Glass is always light in that it's not there as color. Transparency is thin air until you smack into it clearly, a lie everything you saw on some other side. Some of the colors tar baby the light into not getting away from as color, like the hole that swallows anything and never shines and were never color. Anyhow, to some, only something black, like back when Ellington's music was only nigger music, only nigger noise, or if music, only popular, not art, so clearly on the other side. Whatever side of light this is of seeing, this is that darkly raised to seeing through in American glass without distortion of any kind of wisdom or being seen. 
how far off that surface does it have to bounce before blue dissolves from color into light. What the tree took on, wood, wood that has grown around the fence post over the years enclosing it, the metal in a swirl of grain, a tree that has taken a bullet from the Civil War, shot, suddenly exposed in a tabletop, being made, grown into the open by hand, seats us at the bench of our own consequence, shown all around us. We don't get away. We don't get off race. Though we know genetically it doesn't exist, does not erase, but is enacted as our history in us, is enacted as American, the tree does not ungrow the shot, unfire the whip, unlash from the hand having to build here, nor its scar on scar, but to remain in the grain. I have a man I went to school with who became a furniture maker in New Hampshire, and he found a, a tree, he was given a tree, had shot in it, and it turned out after he aged it, or counted the age, turned out to be Civil War. And he made the table so that you could see the bullet. Lastly, there are a couple of poems. I've been writing, uh, since I don't drive anymore, I've been writing the number three. Uh, I always enjoyed writing the number three anyhow. It, it hasn't been a punishment, it's been a real delight. But I, I see uh, people on there and I, I listen to what they say and take down some of the things that they do. So I have three poems. These will be my last three poems. Usually the poems that I write are about women on the bus. I'd listen to the conversations and sometimes I'd be in the conversations. And like in one of the conversations, she was talking about the family buying a boat. And she was saying, well, you know, we don't tan. So may I ask you who your grandmother died? Her blackness you pretended we'd assume a servant's in the photograph. May I ask, did she die herself? I know you all light under an umbrella, don't tan. And she could be seen as she had been made to, too dark for what the sun do. I saw her years ago after she died. And again today in the market, I asked her, I had to know if she was who I knew. Only two things you really has to. That's to stay black and die. Yes, but um, if black leads to some pretend that you have died, except you're black and alive, who are you? She is as hundreds of years old as the stories of the lies of grandmothers in the cellar. May I ask who your grandmother died if she died herself. Then there's Aunt Hank. Uh, you know, black folks have a couple of ways of saying uh, A-U-N-T. Aunt, ain't, and all the other ones too. <laughs> <laughs> but a haint is a, is a ghost. Aunt Hate. She would post herself in the way, in lines headed to transfer stops to change or haunt intersections with four-way full scare scarecrow indecision, stop on the corners of streets and in the aisles of buses, preaching only that which has never been left, these crossings for the road, for choice, the angry fear. She seats at the feast, Thanksgiving, any holiday, any family place setting, the hunger of others' satisfaction for herself, she seeks it, said, this is what she deserves, if only of herself. What she thinks she thinks needs to be said, whatever anyone else thinks, to be honest. So there, she sings from the part of that door she's never gotten through. The eye which requires it all taken off, down, all blown away to get through to. That still nakedness of clear again even if she's not. Still the voice comes through that if we could listen as she is equally raw, here with meat and gut below the skin, beyond the last violence to the silence just before the bone, if we could 
still hear there, we'd hear. And the last one, I was in the bank at the window, and um, a woman came running in, locked the door behind her, and this is what she said. You see me get the hell away from her, don't you? Quick as I can, and I being nice. She act all girlfriend, but that bitch dangerous. She pulls so much rotten shit on peoples, she do to get her ass killed any time. And I don't tend to be nowhere near around. I ain't getting cut down just for standing next to her. I ain't all that innocent. I don't look for nothing that I don't deserve. Listen to people, they have a lot to say. <laughs> Thank you.